Dinesh Bhai, good evening. Tame unmute, sir. Uh, mute, sir. Hello. <laughs> good evening, President. Good evening, good evening, President. Sir, Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. This figure is top top. Thank you, sir. Amado, Sam Rudang, we know Rebu contribution. I'm Rudang, we know Kurupan to be at the Tali for them. That's Rabuka in the Metali Bali Pashi. Ah, Majurati, always. Ajay Karagar Nitani Kutiji. Ajay Karagar Nitani Good evening, everyone. It is Gaga. Good evening. How is Gaz? Because we don't remember something, you know. Book up, Maroso. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Vice President is here, Dina. His first way. Ah. And secondly, Treasurer of IT Bala. Assist Sikwani, Nabu Kuta will give us first. Say, Rebbe Madama? Aji, yes, sir. Bolo, Tame, all right? All right. Ramuk Sabo, Banu. Rupees bhai sahab, madam. Bas fine, fine, fine. Unne proof sahab, chamte ye kitla hota? Ye bhai ye ne rupees. Meeting bhai na sole chuta bolo na sir. Who is not able to do it? I am just saying, I I am like I am just saying, 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 I am just 
ફંક્શનો ફોટો મૂકી દેવા નથી ગમતું એમની મેં તમે રૂપાર જ છો એવરગ્રીન <laughs> 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 ખાનગી માં તમે બધું કરી શકો એમ છો તમારી પાછળ છે બધા મારી જોડે છે પાછળ તો કોઈ નથી યાર મારી સાથે છે હું એમની સાથે છું સુરસુ <laughs> 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 કેટલા વર્ષો નો સેટલું કહી દઉં એક સેકન્ડ નો બદલી નાખ્યો હા ઘણા બધા ખબર જ નથી આવું બધું આવ્યું છે રસ્તો માટલું બધું આવ્યું છે આમાં આવ્યું છે ક્યાં કોઈને ખબર છે સાચી વાત છે ડિબેન્ચર પેલા પ્લેજ કરે અને ફોર્ટી થ્રી બી ની અંદર જે બાદ લેતા હતા એ એમાં રિવર્સ કરી નાખ્યું એ તો પેન્ડિંગ માં છે
વચ્ચે નોટિફિકેશન લાવી લાવવાનું ટ્રેન્ડ ચાલુ થઈ જશે હવે અપીલ આપણે અપીલ ફાઇલ કરીશું નોટિસ બચશે એના પાંચ દસ દિવસ માં નોટિફિકેશન આવી જશે પ્રેસિડેન્ટ ઇમેરેટસ ઓફ ઇન્કમ ટેક્સ બાર એસોસિએશન શ્રી ધીરેશભાઈ પ્રેસિડેન્ટ ઓફ એજીએફટીસી શ્રી કાર્તિકે શાહ past president ashok bhai parik and asim parik from ec parik and company respected senior counsel bombay high court and a legal luminary mr firoz b andharu ji na ji senior advocate high court of gujarat lexpert and most respectful our own mr tushar bhai hemani my colleagues at itba and agftc on virtual dais ladies and gentlemen It is a pride privilege for me to welcome one and all who join this meeting to be addressed by two wizards in the sphere of direct tax laws. I also acknowledge the presence of Mr. Asim Parikh from AC Parikh and Company who had generously donated the amount for budget meeting in the interest of member in public at large. We have invited a personality to deliver critically analyze the budget proposals who is addressing on various forum on the union budget every year since 1994 and still counting even at the age of 72 none else but senior counsel from high court of bombay mr firoz b andharu ji na ji his keynote will be a step forward to educate the members which will help them to plan the tax matter of their client at the same time a young a energetic legal expert senior advocate of high court of gujarat mr tushar bhai hemani will deal the provisions in depth and analyze the pros and cons of the proposed provisions put forward by the honorable the finance minister we have tried to upkeep a fine balance to deliver the goods from our end as experienced scholar on one hand to young legal expert on the other hand to deal with the subject sir while discussing and analyzing the budget proposal we came across such an absurd irrational and unconstitutional provision proposed under section 68 of the act by honorable the finance minister the reason why number 1 with all good reasoning law is settled from years together number 2 addition under section 68 is a deeming fiction and number 3 it is a shifting burden how can department lay down a burden upon the ssc which lie upon the department i request both the expert kindly to highlight about the constitutional validity of proposed amendment in section 68 which will ruin the acceptance of borrowing person say and largely affected trade and commerce with this i once again welcome all of you and i request president of agftc kartikesha to give his welcome address thank you murdang bhai i uh, i thank uh, income tax bar association president nudang h vakil president emirates shri dhiraj bhai sir ac parik and uh, company to uh, to join agftc on this very prestigious uh, platform of budget uh, ac parik and company budget meeting of income tax bar association i heartily welcome the learned and most expert faculty senior advocate firoz b andariu ji uh, sir and uh, senior advocate tushar hemani sir for enlightening all of us about the budget provisions and nitty gritties of the budget and i uh, i welcome all the participants and all the members respected members of both the association thank you so much thank you kartike bhai i request president emirates shri dhiraj bhai to say few words about this meeting ઇન્કમ ટેક્સ બાર એસોસિએશનના પંચોતેર વર્ષના બહુ જ ઉત્સાહી પ્રમુખ મુદાંગભાઈ ફેડરેશનના પ્રમુખ કાર્તિકેભાઈ આજના બંને વિદ્વાન વક્તાઓ અને મિત્રો બજેટ જયારે આપણે સાંભળતા હતા સીતારામનનું ત્યારે એમ લાગતું હતું કે બધું સરસ આવી રહ્યું છે આમ થઈ રહ્યું છે આ થશે પણ ઇન્કમ ટેક્સમાં કંઈ સુધારા માટે એક શબ્દ કે એક વાક્ય એમને ઉચ્ચાર્યું નથી 
ત્યારે આયા ને વાંચ્યા પછી લાગ્યું કે આટલા બધા સુધારા થયા આટલી ફાર રીચિંગ અસરો વર્ષોથી સેટલ થયેલો કાયદો તમારે સોર્સ નો પણ સોર્સ આપવાનો એ તો કઈ નવી જેવું લાગે એક તો પૈસા જરૂર હતા આપણે પૈસા લેવા જઈએ પેલા કે ભાઈ તું ક્યાંથી લાવ્યો મને કે એટલે કે જાઓ પૈસા નહીં મળે તમને ઓપ્શન નહીં કોઈ એટલે આ ભયંકર સુધારો આવે છે એને શું અસરો પડશે તો બે વિદ્વાન વખતો જ આપણને જણાવે છે પણ આ ઉપરાંત ચેરિટી ટ્રસ્ટ ના પણ બે સુધારા બહુ અગત્યના છે હા રીચિંગ ઇફેક્ટ થાય એ બધા સુધારા સાંભળી એમની પાસે એ જ વધારે અગત્યનો છે આપણે સમજીએ અને મૃદાંગભાઈ જે કીધું કે કોન્સ્ટિટ્યુશનલ વેલિડિટી શું છે એ તો આ બે વિદ્વાનો નક્કી કરશે જ પણ એ સિવાય પણ આને કેમ બીટ આઉટ થવું અને બીજું શું થાય એની બી થોડી સૂચનાઓ અથવા થોડું સમજણ આપી દે તો વધારે સારું થશે કારણ કે આ બધાને નડવાનું છે પૈસા તો આપશે જ નહીં કે તમે તમારું પૂછનાર પણ હું પૈસા ક્યાંથી લાવે હું ઇન્કમ ટેક્સ ભરું છું મારો પાન નંબર આ છે એટલે એવું કહીએ તો ઇન્કમ ટેક્સ ભરાય નહીં તપાસ રહી નહીં ફરજ કરવાની એ પણ આપણે જાણવું જોઈએ આ આજના વિદ્વાન વક્તાઓ ને સાંભળવા માટે અત્યારથી બધા આતુર છે એક થી સાથે પંચોતેર જણા તો જોડી ગયા પાંચ જ મિનિટમાં અને આવી મિટિંગો માની ત્યાં હાજરી ખૂબ ઓછી થતી હોય છે આજના મિટિંગના સ્પોન્સર અશોક પરીખભાઈ મારા મિત્ર અને એમના પુત્ર બંને અભિનંદન આપું છું કે દર વર્ષે બજેટ મિટિંગો તેઓ સ્પોન્સર કરે છે જય હિન્દ થેન્ક યુ ધીરેશભાઈ એન્ડ વિથ ધીઝ નાઉ આઈ રિક્વેસ્ટ સિનિયર વાઇસ પ્રેસિડન્ટ એન્ડ પાસ્ટ પ્રેસિડન્ટ ઓફ ઇન્કમ ટેક્સ બાર એસોસિએશન શ્રી હિરેનભાઈ ટુ ઇન્ટ્રોડ્યુસ ટુડેઝ ફકી નોટ સ્પીકર મિસ્ટર ફિરોઝભાઈ અંદર રોજી થેન્ક યુ વેરી મચ પ્રેસિડન્ટ મૃદનભાઈ Am I audible? Yes, yes. President Emeritus of ITBA, Shri Dhiraj Bhai, a young and well-deserving president of ITBA, Mr. Murdang H. Vakil, president of AGFTC, Shri Kartike B. Shah, Mr. Asim Ashok Bhai Parik from AC Parik and Company, senior counsel high court of mumbai and keynote scholar advocate filos b andhyaru jina ji senior advocate high court of gujarat and a legal expert a expert mr tusar hemani office bearers of itba my colleagues at agftc and all dear good listeners from every parts of the state of gujarat at the outset i congratulate president mr murdang h choki duly supported by president kartik a b shah to invite personalities who are designated as senior counsel by the respective high courts to critically analyze as a keynote address to the proposal of union budget 2022 and also close by close analysis of provisions of the direct taxes proposed by honorable the finance minister in her budget proposal mrudang bhai it is a unique combination of an experienced scholar in form of stalwart adhyaru jina ji at one hand as a keynote address and a young expert in form of mr tusar hemani on the other hand to deal with the complexity of as many as 84 amendments put forward on very silent mode by honorable Mrs Nirmala Sitaraman coming to the task assigned by me by president Mr Murdang H Chokil to introduce a very good friend of mine Mr Andhyaru Jina ji and who do not deny to say no on my personal request let me introduce a veteran a scholar a charming personality a man of virtues to this august gathering friends look 
it is milky biodata why i said scholar number 1 he obtain become with owners number 2 he is the gustav k kanga scholar in the indian contract act in the first llb examination and in second llb examination too number 3 Mr Feroz was awarded the Justice Arnold scholarship for securing highest marks in Hindu law number 4 my dear friend was awarded the rotary foundation scholarship of the rotary international to study post graduate law at the university of miami coral gables usa number 5 he was awarded scholarship in international and comparative law at paris france friends kindly put your hands together to hear and know that during his entire academic career mr andhyaru jina ji has won more than 70 prizes and trophies at school college and university level more than 70 prizes and trophies at school college and university level coming to his second virtue of fluency mr andhyaru jina ji participated in a number of debates allocation and discussion competitions he also represented twice the bombay university and won the all india debating competitions at ranchi and madras his contribution towards education as a honorary professor at st javier's institute of management studies and professor at hr college in mercantile law so as a visiting professor at the kc college of tax management was outstanding one a thorough gentleman on a rotary scholarship acted as an ambassador of goodwill traveling across the united states of america he also went on a professional visit to usa and addressed a number of clubs and associations on indian culture and law having traveled round the globe my dear friend widely traveled and toured all the five continents he attended the international conferences in atlanta and also in canada the foundation of his career was laid down in the chambers of mr r j kola and mr b a palkhiwala his specialization is with tax matters and company law he was instrumental in some of the important and outstanding cases that have laid down and more importantly interpreted the tax laws of india more importantly interpreted the tax laws of india and that is why in the year 2001 mr firoz was designated as senior counsel by the bombay high court since last 28 years that is from 1994 as our president endorses mr andhyaru jina ji delivers every year speech on the union budget in mumbai his budget speeches have been well received and acknowledged in various forums at ahmedabad bangalore chennai hyderabad pune mangalore rajkot and tirupur he is enjoying several of his capabilities people like andhyaru jina ji are few and far between his choice 
to solve the profession at an age of 72 is of immense value and thank for so many reasons and appreciate it beyond words. I impose Bairam Shah, Pikaji, and Daru Jinaji as a stalwart lawyer, a professor, a fluent public speaker, a scholar, and above all, a champion of all the champions, a perfect gentleman. Thank you, thank you very much for the patient hearing. And before I hand over to President Murdanbhai, I also emphasize to both the dignitaries kindly to highlight the proposed provision of Section 68 and its constitutional validity. More particularly, the addition on this count is taxed at a rate of 60% and concept of shifting burden will be brushed away. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, such a deserving and effective introduction. And now with this, I request Firoz sir to critical analyze the union budget 2022. I welcome you, sir. Welcome. Thank you very much for all the good words uh, here and by. Uh, I remembered having come personally to Ahmedabad to deliver some talks when Hirenbhai was the president. Now his son is the president. So like father, like son. And when Hirenbhai requested me, I think that if the son also follows the footsteps of the father in such a good way, I think I should oblige him by coming and delivering the speech virtually Though I think I'm always effective if I'm there physically. Thank you for all the good words. Uh, let me come straight away to certain important issues <clears throat> and critical analysis of the budget. The first point which I want to make it very clear is that this budget is required to be examined from the point of view of three or four main points. Number one, inflation. There is a huge inflationary tendency which has gripped not only India, but almost all countries of the world. So it is to be viewed from inflation point of view. Number two, very important, joblessness. The recent ILO information report points out that more than 52 million people would be out of jobs. Number three, in the light of the pandemic, because the pandemic has had a very devastating effect on all sections of the people and finally to be looked into from the macroeconomic point of view on the ground that there is constant increase in the price of crude oil and please note the rise in the crude oil prices India imports almost 80 percent of its oil requirements that will have a very cascading effect on the entire economy. Mr. President, one observation. Two years ago, the finance minister had made a statement that for the purposes of stability and uniformity of the tax structure, the tax rates would not be tinkered with. The tax labs have not been touched. Though it is necessary to point out that last year, there was a little tinkering for the employees whose contribution to the Provident Fund over two and a half lakhs of rupees, the interest was taxable. But this year, not touching and increasing the tax rates 
and the slabs is not correct looking into the inflation tendencies which the economy is facing. I wish the tax slab would have been increased that no tax up to 5 lakhs. It is absolutely required and essential looking into the inflation, the joblessness, and the various pressures on the economy due to pandemic, the tax rates ought to have been increased substantially and the tax rates lower because with the compounding surcharge and all these things, it would work out to almost 35% and above, which is not very competitive compared to the Southeast Asian economies. In the budget speech, the finance minister devoted one hour on macroeconomics. On the macroeconomic front, if you ask me, the budget is excellent. Trust to infrastructure and all the other points. But looking into direct taxes, the finance minister spoke for less than half an hour. And the way it was presented, we were very happy on the ground that there is no major changes coming which should have been the correct policy. But afterwards, when you see that what is said and what is existing, there is a big cleavage and a gap. I start with all the eight or 10 points which I want to bring forth to you. The first issue is upgraded returns. Look at the finance minister's speech. It says in a very simple terms that you are entitled to upgrade your return to see that there is no mistakes, there is uniformity, everything is correct. If there is some omission, etc., I'm giving you a moratorium period of 24 months, two years to rectify the mistake and please come out do the thing and be clean. Very good. Now, to come out clean is not that easy. The upgraded return carries with it additional tax. The additional tax, if you do it in one year, which means within 12 months, 25% from 13 months to 24 months, if you file an upgraded return, it will be 50%. Mr. President, I think an honest taxpayer who wants to come out clean, or if a person who is complying with tax laws, his chartered accountant instructs him and says, oh, you have left, we have left out in the computation, it is possible because with so many columns, so many things, we have claimed less depreciation, there is a less loss, there is this, this deduction is not taken into consideration, this item was omitted. Let us come clean. We are responsible citizens, we don't want to do anything wrong. So when I want to do this, I filed an updated return, but it comes at a price of 25 or 50% which is not fair at all. So now you don't say upgraded return. The nomenclature is upgraded return, but it should be upgraded return with additional tax. That should have been the correct nomenclature. Secondly, look at the unfairness. You say at one time, you want people to come out, be clean. There is a prohibition you can file the upgraded return only if you have to pay additional tax. If you have to collect a refund or some allowances, etc., has not been done and therefore you are entitled to a refund. So you are upgrading your return to the correct level of uh, what the income has to be. That is not permissible. 
The upgraded return is restricted only to paying of additional tax, not to claim additional refund, not to claim loss, or not to claim any advantage. Number three, if any notice is served to you under section 142.1 or 143.2 or any other notices have been served or the proceedings are pending, you are departed from going into the upgraded uh, returns uh, scheme. Number four, if there is notice under any other law, say Smugglers Act, uh, Binami Transactions Act or uh, uh, Money Laundering Act, etc., Black Money's Act, then also you are prohibited. So operation of other economic laws are also a barrier to get into it. Fifth point, there is no clarity. Please try to understand. A person tries to come clean, files an upgraded return, shows the correct position. What is the guarantee? that after upgrading the return, it will be accepted or will it be subject to scrutiny? And after scrutiny, some additional amount will have to be paid. So Mr. Chairman and many other points based on this, I think so this whole concept is what? It is nothing else but a new voluntary amnesty scheme with the garb of paying additional tax. It is not for honest citizens. It is for those who have not done their homework properly or who have concealed. One opportunity is given to them that you come out clean, make the taxes and do it. But it is, according to me, a kind of a misty scheme. It's my first observation. My second observation is in the rates of educational and health surcharge for long-term capital gains, they have rationalized it. Good, I'm not saying, but where is where there is merit, I want to point out. They have done it in a good way. The rates as it existed was 50 lakhs capital gains, 50 lakhs to 1 crore, 10%. 1 crore to 2 crores, it was 15%. Uh, 2 crores to 5 crores, 25%. And over 5 crores on the capital gains, the education and health surcharge was to the extent of 37%. Rationalize it, it makes it 15%. Good step. Of course, the original limit of 10% remains. But in this connection, I want to come to one other point. They have promised that they will not make any retrospective amendment. In this budget, there is a retrospective amendment which is with effect from 1 4 2005. 17 years. It is on the point of cess. Educational health says, let me tell you that there were tribunal judgments. First, there was some high court judgment which said that there is a difference between tax, surcharge, and says. Says stands on a different footing. Because it stands on a different footing, says is altogether different. And there were tribunal and other judgments which stated that it could be allowed as a deduction. And what people used to do, chartered accountants and lawyers, they used to file an additional ground in the tribunal because this is a matter purely of law, doesn't require to go into any legal issues, relying upon the tribunal and other decisions and claim a deduction. Now an amendment is brought. That too with retrospective effect, 17 years are covered. According to me, this is not correct. Not correct in the sense that you can't have a retrospective amendment 
because already the government has learned bitter lessons on the question of retrospective. If it had to be done, you do it prospectively. I have, I'm not saying no. You do it prospectively. But one point, I want to make it very clear at the outset that in this budget, there is lot of tinkerings. If you ask me to describe the budget, I will do it in one word, complicated. It is only increasing the compliance, forget the compliance, but plugging all the little hoop holes which the assessee, the chartered accountants were entitled to legitimate plan the tax planning and the issues. If there is a judgment which is in favor of the assessee, whether it be by the tribunal or it be by the high court, I think so the duty of the government is that the tribunal, that the high court's judgments have to be respected. They are also organs of the government. The tribunal, the income tax tribunal's judgments are respected everywhere, right up to the Supreme Court. And I'm reminded of the English case of Q Queens versus Bura, where it was mentioned by the Privy Council that all courts are tribunals, but all tribunals are not courts. In this budget, there is number of instances of tribunal's judgments being overturned. This is just not correct. Instead, the government should have come out with one line sentence that whatever is the decision of the tribunal, it will be respected. If the tribunal decides an issue in favor of the assessee, then it is immediately overturned. This is not a correct approach for an honest taxpayer. I would also like to point out that the budget speech showed a rosy picture, but if you dwell into the amendments, there are, as pointed out, about 84 or 85 amendments, 10 insertions, one retrospective amendment, one substitution. Now, if you are having so many amendments, where will the clarity be? What is the position of the tax advisors today? Because if you advise something today, even after one year, two years, or three years, it is bound to be upturned. Where will the honest taxpayer do? And how does he overcome that? In this context, let me come to the third issue on bonus stripping. You see, there was dividend stripping. Now, under 94 subsection 8, some words are added. Securities, shares, even rights are included. What is the implication of that? Let me tell you. You see, you, uh, you sell a property. You get capital gains. You've got capital gains of 10 crores on sale of property. Four crores is the cost. After indexation, it is five crores. Five crores, 10 minus five, five crores is your long-term capital gains. You go to chartered accountants and legal experts to say, let's see, five crores is a lot of money. Please show me some way to reduce the tax burden. The planning was, you buy some equity share quoted on the stock market, which is pregnant with dividend. It is come dividend. You buy the share. After that, the share, supposing you buy a share of a limited company, there is one to one bonus. So thousand rupees is the price of the share. After the bonus, it becomes 500. What we used to is take the thousand rupees original uh, share, Minus 500 is the, now the new cost, 500 is the loss, and set it off against the long-term capital gains. Legitimately done. Nothing wrong. So now 
dividend stripping, now even bonus stripping is done. Now, this is some kind of a major tinkering in the method of going ahead in planning and in advice to the clients. Take the fourth instance, which was mentioned a lot, and that is the amendment in section 68. According to me, the addition and bringing in borrowings and all this is not correct. To add insult to injury, two important issues come. I'm not on the major points because those major points of borrowings, etc., and debentures would be dealt, but on the main point. Section first, cast onus on the assessee. So now to, to prove all this is on the assessee. And secondly, you have to prove the source of source. Settled law, starting from Rohini builders up to number of tribunal decisions, high court decisions. Gujarat uh, High Court and Tribunal has laid down very clearly in number of cases that you don't have to tell a person about source of source. Now, you are required to prove source of source. According to me, in its anxiety to overcome this particular point of section 68, I am of the view that this section would be a section which would hurt the assessee and even the honest assessee and also its constitutional validity will require consideration. I come to the fifth tinkering. See, very simple provision, section 194IA. 194, one, uh, 194IA deals with TDS. You have to deduct TDS when you sell the property and make the payment to the buyer. You are aware that TDS is to be deducted at 1%. Settle point, no dispute. You deduct 1% on the amount paid, on the consideration paid, on the actual amount which you have paid by check to the other person. Now the law says that no, the payment of consideration is not important. It is the stand duty ready reckoner value, which will have to be taken into consideration. Let me just illustrate to you in a simple illustration. You sell the property for 70 lakhs. Ready reckoner value is 76 lakhs. You have actually paid 70 lakhs. You deduct TDS at 1% on 70 lakhs. There is also the provision on variation of 10% up to. So 7 lakhs would be there. The stamp duty valuation is 76. You are well within the four corners of the law. And therefore, you have done it at 70 lakhs, which is totally correct. Now the law says, no, you may have paid 70 lakhs, but you will have to deduct TDS on the ready reckoner value as reflected in the, uh, and on which the stamp duty has been paid. This I think is totally unfair. I can appreciate that you want to have a linkage of this section along with the section 50 section, but that should not be the main motive and the more main point to deprive a correct transaction. If there is a genuine transaction, you know that the valuation of a property is very, very difficult. It For one locality, for one building, it would be a higher value. For the other, it could be lower. It depends on number of factors. And therefore to say, that when the realistic price is not considered, but an artificial notional amount 
of stamp duty valuation as per the ready reckoner is taken, then I think it would be very difficult. Of course, it doesn't say in those properties where the consideration paid is higher and the stamp duty is valued less that you pay on stamp duty. Then they should have adopted that same logic to see that it goes in the correct way. This is just not correct. You see, the question is the honest taxpayer or the assessee is put to a lot of inconvenience on even just taking an analogy on the upgraded returns. I told you one thing, I'm not entitled to get refund. I can't upgrade my return for refund. Take one more point. What is, what, there is, it can come up for scrutiny. Number three, what is the guarantee that in fact, when I want to come out clean, they go ahead and invoke the provisions of section 270A, misreporting, underreporting. So by going into this, I'm creating greater problems for myself. Take the sixth point. The sixth is section 194R says that any benefit, advantage or perquisite given to any senior executive directors, etc., by a company, which is over 20,000 rupees, then the company is required to deduct TDS at 1%. Now, a company, let me put it this way, a company gives, say, free airline ticket, boarding and lodging to its senior executive or directors to travel. I'm taking an instance that the company does not claim it as a deduction. Mark, what I'm saying, company has not claimed it as a deduction. If it is over 20,000, now, whether you have claimed it as a deduction or not, the fact that there is a factum of payment, you are required to deduct TDS at 1%. So if you have deducted 1% TDS, what is the logical sequita? And the consequences, the consequences is that the person who has received the advantage, benefit, or allowance, or freebies, he will be also obliged to show that as perquisite in his return and it would be taxable. So if these are the kinds of tinkerings, it is very, very difficult. So anyway, the government is not giving any leverage of tax planning or benefit at all to the individual taxpayer. Take one more point. The, what suits the government is done. There is omission of section 144 B9. By the omission, what used to happen, just let me give you a practical way. In faceless assessments, if there are three criteria, you file a writ petition in the court saying that the assessing officer has not given proper notice or have not received the notice. Number two, no opportunity of being heard has been given to me. Number three, the draft assessment order has not been served. The final order has been reached. These are the points in faceless assessments which are encumbered in this uh, section which were obliged to follow. Now, what was the trend of judicial decisions? The trend of judicial decisions was that the, uh, that the courts used to remand the matter back to the assessing officer for reconsideration. However, recently there were two, three judgments which stated that no, as per the section, it is non-est. Therefore, they said that the whole assessment order is valid. They never remanded matter back to the assessing officer. They said that the assessment proceedings is non-est. To overcome those judgments, they have now omitted. This is the crux of faceless assessment. 
This is the main theme of graceless assessment. That main section is now given a go by. And also connected with that, I want to point out, they know and understand the difficulties in the faceless assessments. They wanted to extend the concept to uh, DRT, D, uh, dispute resolution, and even to tribunals. Now that is extended to 24. So the whole point is there is very little gateway to do and get over certain issues. Take another case of repetitive appeals. Now in repetitive appeals, the provision is under 158 AB, looks good that if one issue is involved in a number of years, every subsequent year you go on filing the appeal. So the government has come out with a procedure that we will not file repetitive appeals that will save the time of the court, the litigation and everything. We will continue with one and the outcome of that one will apply thereafter to everybody. So what they have done is they have formed a collegium, a collegium of two commissioners who will examine the question of law, whether it is a substantial question of law, looking into the points and then deliberate whether such a case requires. They'll send a letter to the SSE saying, let's see, we are giving you we, uh, the point very clearly. We are following only one appeal, not the others. Good. No multiplicity of litigations, no repetitive appeals. But please note one point. Now here I'm coming and pointing out what is the issue. Assessing officer on a simple point decides the issue against the assessor. CIT is in your favor. Tribunal decides in your favor. Matter is carried to the high court. The high court decides in your favor. The matter is carried to the Supreme Court. Mr. President, you know the vagaries in litigation. Anything can happen at any time. Supreme Court upheld the view of the assessing officer. Of course, for that assessment year to reach all these stages would take approximately 35 to 40 years. At that stage, if you lose at the Supreme Court and you have succeeded everywhere, tell me, number one, who will bear the interest burden? The interest burden would be approximately, which we have calculated, is, is nearing 300%. Forget the 220 and forget the penalty and all that. Why can't the government say that in a repetitive appeal, and this after a long period would be a burden not only for an individual, but to his heirs. Or in a small private limited company, it may be wiped off. If in such instances, why can't they make it clear that in such repetitive appeals, number one, no interest would be levied. There'll be no 222 interest. Number three, you know that there would be automatic waiver. There is waiver application which you can make to the commissioner. It would be a good case because here is a question that you can't charge interest because you have written to me about repetitive appeals. But a waiver experience with the commissioners, you are aware of it. So this interest burden, who is going to bear that should have been clarified as a matter of a fallout of this whole thing. The next issue, again controversial, is the amendment made to explanation to section 37.1 on any activity which is illegal, which is prohibited by law, or which is forbidden by law or is against public policy. In that they have added the amendment 
I'm concentrating on B, A and B, the B part, which talks about benefit, allowance, perquisite to any person, which is prohibited by law. You look at the memorandum explaining the provisions of the bill, eight paragraphs, three or four pages, full details and analysis and a big essay on it. Catching the doctors, medical companies. The issue arose this way. Medical, medical companies used to hold conferences, lunches, dinners, parties, gifts, promotion for the advent of a new medicine and various other allowances were given, sometimes to a larger extent. But see, a pharmaceutical company doing business has to promote its products. These were shown under the head uh, sales promotion and claimed as a deduction, legitimately. Because you have to promote your product. Now, this matter, of course, I'm not going into details about the Himachal Pradesh first judgment of constitutional validity of 2020. I'm coming to the main gist. According to me, out of about four tribunal judgments, the recent 2019 or 18 judgment, 19 judgment of the Ahmedabad tribunal appears to me to be very, very logical. There is also judgment of the Mumbai tribunal. All the four tribunals, Delhi tribunal also very good. All the tribunals have correctly come. But look at the logic what they have said. They caught you that this is illegal under the Indian Medical Council Act of 2005. The tribunal has so lucidly brought out this point that it says, oh, boy, what are you looking? The Indian Medical Council rules of 2005 apply to the individual doctors. It does not apply to the company. It is for the doctor to decide. It is not for the company. Company gives. Companies in the promotion. To accept it. And if you have done it, maybe an illegal point. Not an illegal, but it would be violation of the code of conduct of 2005 under IMC. That's a different issue. You are confusing the two issues. However, they have held that any freebies given, any such things given to doctors is not a permissible deduction. Why? Why? Not a permissible deduction. Agreed. But why? Because it is against public policy. It is prohibited by law, the Indian Medical Council, which does not apply to companies at all. In my respectful submissions, the correct thing would be to have accepted gracefully the four tribunal judgments which were in favor of the companies. Then I think you are putting an end to the litigation. You, uh, uh, Mr. President, one important point I'm bringing forth today. The government has done very right to increase the tax limits. Excellent step, good thinking in the right direction. Add to it one further point. Add to it. That if a tribunal or a high court has given a good speaking order, such an order should be stuck to. You cannot then change the law. It is the law of the land. The tribunal does a great job. The high court also does a phenomenal job. And the Supreme Court also. But don't take up the matter up to their tribunal as the greatest authority on the tax laws. The, the decision should be accepted gracefully by the government. I come to the last issue because of the time, because seven o'clock I have another presentation. So this is on cryptocurrency. It's a very talked about subject. I'm putting my thoughts on cryptocurrency in this way. They have made a definition 
in section 247 capital A. Now this definition of virtual uh, digital asset is borrowed and taken from the selective committee report on cryptocurrency bill, which is spending. You compare it, it is identically picked up and put here. You have not understood that income tax is a different ball game than a general law. Be that as it may, the definition is very, very wide to include even money and fungible and all these things. My observations, point number one, the idea which people had that cryptocurrency would be banned in India, that you cannot do it, that talk is out. Because if income tax accepts it and taxes it, it is valid now. So dealing in cryptocurrency is valid. In any fungible uh, digital instruments, it is valid. I'll give you one uh, illustration. See the case of Bata, Calcutta High Court and then further, where on sale of shops, Pagri was paid, premium salami was paid, in check accepted. Pagri or salami technically is not permitted under the rent act. But the tax law stated that you, if you accept uh, such an amount, it would be taxed. It became legal. Now people are paying salami and other transactions in rental properties. So here, please note, it is now cryptocurrencies are valid. The definition extends to rupee, rupee payment, which means, according to me, the point of extension, this will definitely pave the way for an Indian cryptocurrency in the near future. Number two, they have said 30% tax flat. Number three, no set off. What is the implication of this? This is, sounds illogical to me. In any transactions of similar nature, like in shares, stocks, etc., or even in speculation, you are entitled to set up one loss against the other under the same head. This is under the same head. So now here they say no. Every transaction which you enter into, if there is a profit, you pay 30%. You are not entitled to set off. This is not the correct approach. There should be a set off allowed because it is under the similar bane and similar transactions. Proposition which emerges is that the tax of 30% on cryptocurrency is transaction based and is not a composite transaction tax. So per transaction, if there is a, a profit, you pay. If there is a loss, good luck to you. The government is only interested in sharing profits, not in participation of losses or set off. One good point connected with this is the connectivity and digitalization steps which government has taken, connecting the post office account with the bank accounts. Good step for senior citizens, rural, digital, etc. And one last observation of mine. I want to make one thing very clear. Nowadays, my honest advice is be very, very careful in investing in cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies already are high. If you buy it, any wrong decision, the loss is yours. The profit is only 70%. Think 10 times before you do this. And even on the stock market, think 10 times with this artificial way in which the market is going. One another tinkering, very small, but I want to bring to the notice, overcoming a tribunal judgment. You see, there was no revision under Section 263, 
Why? Transfer pricing. In other words, it was held that a TPO's order is not subjected to transfer pricing. Uh, tr a TPO's order is not subject to, to revision under 263. Now the law is changed so that revision can also go ahead with 263 also. Uh, Mr. President, with this, I come to the end. I have put about nine or 10 points for consideration on technical issues. I only say one thing, that please for stabilization of law, make it a policy decision not to make so many amendments, changes, modifications, etc. Please, if there is a judgment which is good and a speaking and logical of the tribunal or of the court, accept it. Or of the Supreme Court, of course, Supreme Court is the law of the land. That is a different issue, but please be good enough. And more particularly, if it is in favor of the assessee, give the assessee a chance because now the coffers are filling because of compliance normally by honest, genuine, and good citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. It is indeed a pleasure and birth to listen Sadantaru Jinaji. The way he analyzed the budget, I am sure the participant will be immensely benefited from the speech. As Feroz sir had already preoccupied commitment, he has requested to leave the webinar. So I request on the treasurer of AGFTC, CSC on Bhavsar to offer a certificate of appreciation to Feroz sir. Sir, please kindly accept from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I request C. Ashish Tekwani to introduce another legal expert and senior advocate, Tushar Bhai Hemani. It is said that when you have good friends, your job is easy. So being the friend of president of IT bar and being friend of president of AGFTC, I have been fortunate enough to be given the easiest task of the day to introduce the legal expert who requires practically no, in a, no introduction to all the persons who are listening this webinar because they are, he's a part of us. <clears throat> but Damn. senior advocate Tushar Himani, sir, is a BCom LLB chartered accountant. He has successfully argued complex matters relating to direct and indirect taxation, corporate and commercial fiscal laws before Honorable Supreme Court, High Court, Tribunal, Commission, and various appellate authorities. He is one of the youngest at bar to have been conferred the senior designation by the Gujarat High Court in 2019. He has been the president of Income Tax Appellate Bar Tribunal Ahmedabad for the term 2015 to 2017. He is a regular speaker at various conferences, seminar, meetings of varied professional bodies in the law in the field of taxation and corporate laws. He is a regular writer of columns, articles, paper for professional journals and conferencing. He is also visiting faculty at various institutes, universities, colleges, management and law schools on the subject of taxation and corporate law. Sir, I would like you to start your uh, speech. Thank you, Ashishwe. Good evening, friends. When I saw Honorable the Finance Minister delivering the speech, I thought that there is not going to be anything worth discussing. However, maybe within an hour or so, when I downloaded the finance bill and just started going through it, I realized that uh, task is much tougher. There are so many amendments. Some are absolutely crucial. Some are not so crucial. But nonetheless, it affects all of us. Those who practice income tax laws, maybe even direct, indirect, both taxes, there are a large number of amendments. Again, some are good, some are bad. 
But nonetheless, amendments are there in the finance bill, more than 80 to be precise. So we have to discuss the amendments in a logical manner. Again, let me make it very clear at the outset that I'm not going to discuss all the clauses of the finance bill. We'll be discussing some important clauses. I have, I understand now roughly 80 minutes available with me. And then within these 80 minutes or much before that, I'll be in a position to discuss uh, whatever is important for our day-to-day -day practices. Friends, as they say that for any business, what is most important is certainty. Look, none of us, we are all citizens of India. We are all faithful to India. And therefore, none of us do not want to pay the taxes. Having said that, what is important is we want certainty. So when I'm starting my business, when I'm initiating or commencing a commercial activity, I must know in advance that this is going to be my tax liability. Because if there is a certainty that for next five years, 10 years, 15 years, this is how your tax is going to be computed, I can factor in that tax liability while arranging my commercial affairs. However, once I start carrying on the business, and then I'm told that, no, no, sir, you ought not to have incurred this expenditure because we are not going to give you any deduction against that expenditure. And therefore, you pay the taxes on that, which is going to be a significant portion of my overall business commercial activities. Then that hurts. And that is where the two significant departure from earlier finance bills, which, which can be observed and which, which are very, very disturbing. And these two significant departures are in the nature of first large number of retrospective amendments. Look, there are two kinds of amendments which create problems retroactively. One, the date of introduction of the section itself says that we are going to introduce this section from a particular date, which is a date preceding the finance bill. And the second is, Though apparently, on the face of it, the amendment is supposed to be a prospective amendment. However, the language used for the purpose of clarification or the position has always been like this and we are just clarifying kind of a language, creates more litigation and more problems. Second is, the, the second problem or the second issue, which is uh, creating problem is the mindset of the government look uh, we we have certain case laws we have certain settled laws keeping that law in mind because income tax act as all of us are aware that it's not a very uh, a simple reading it, it it creates a lot many problems and lot many confusions than solving so over a period of time we have started uh, kind of you know taking court judgments as a basis, and we have started arranging our affairs in that way. Now, the trend is that government, someone higher up in the government, sat down and started looking into each and every section. For each and every section, they started picking up the judgments which have laid down the law, and they changed the language, whereby they try to nullify those judgments. Now, this is again not a very good and healthy practice for the simple reason that. Income tax is a law of precedence. We have a large number of precedents and we rely on those precedents for the purpose of bringing certainty and clarity to that. Now you are changing the language so as to change the nature of the game, so as to change the rule of the game. And now you will say that, sir, sorry, that judgment is no more applicable because now we have changed the very law itself. So retrospective amendments and playing a game of cat and mouse, whereby each and every judgment of the high court or tribunal is, in fact, Supreme Court also is sought to be, tried to be nullified. With this backdrop, let us start looking at the finance bill and some of the provisions which are really interesting and very, uh, to say, uh, disturbing because most of them are 
uh, negative, some are positive. I also be giving credit to the government as and when I find that some uh, provisions are positive. Friends, as they say that the detail lies, the devil lies in detail. The finance bill contains all the details and let us look at the devil up close and personal. I will start with uh, some very significant uh, sections. Let us start with three sections which we use on our day to day practice and try to understand what is it that is now sought to be done and which is how it is going to affect all of us. Uh, mind you, uh, I'll start with 37. Probably uh, my predecessor speaker, Mr. Andar Juna, touched some of the uh, sections. But uh, let me, even at the cost of repetition, put across my point. So let us start with section 37. Look, 37 is a section which is a residuary section. All of us are aware that the expenditure which we claim from 30 to 36, those expenditure which are not covered by these sections can be claimed as a residuary expenditure under section 37. The expenditure must be revenue in nature, must not be capital and must not be personal. So long as we fulfill these conditions, we can claim the expenditure under section 37. 37 has one explanation. And explanation one was pointing out that in case if you have incurred any expenditure, which is in violation of any law, then that expenditure would not be allowed. Historically, in good old days, people paid extortion money. Some builders claim those extortion money as an allowable business expenditure. Bombay Tribunal allowed that. In order to overcome that, explanation one was added under section 37, which said that anything which is in contravention of any law is not to be allowed as a business expenditure. No dispute on that score. Now we have explanation three, which is supposed to be explaining explanation one, that what is the meaning of expenditure incurred by the SSE for any purpose, which is an offense or which is prohibited by law. How do you interpret this? For that, we have now one explanation with effect from 1-4-2022, which is termed as explanation number three. Now explanation number three says, that for the purpose of understanding the expression of explanation one, namely what is illegal and what is it that is in violation of uh, a, a particular statutory provision shall be interpreted or shall include and shall always deem to have included. And then there are three categories. So this is the language which is going to create large number of problems that the illegality shall include and shall always be deemed to have included what, what, does the, what is the meaning of that? Because then someone might say that, sir, this was always the position. It is only that the parliament has clarified this position. If that be the, the interpretation, then probably the revenue might argue that though it is effective from 1-4-2022, but the position of law was always like this and therefore retrospective. And what, what are these three categories which are now sought to be covered under <coughs> the prohibited category. The first category is the, the scope is now being widened. Earlier, the law was that whatever is in violation of Indian laws, not allowable as an allowable expenditure. Now they say that India and abroad. So even out of India, if you incur certain expenditure, if that expenditure is prohibited under the laws of that country, then you have to uh, bear the disallowance under 37 because that expenditure is not permissible. So you not only have to keep in mind the laws of India, but you have to keep in mind the cross-border laws and find out that whether this expenditure is allowable in the respective country or what we are paying is permissible under the law. Second and the more disturbing is that if at all any benefit or perquisite is, is given to somebody in whatever form, in whatever manner, and if that somebody happens to be carrying on a business or a profession, and if that business or a profession is governed by some body, some rule, some regulation, some bylaws, then those expenditure in the hands of the payer company would be disallowed. So the whole idea is to target the doctors. That pharmaceutical companies, 
when they launch a product when they want to market a product when they want to create an awareness in the market or simply for the purpose of giving education to the doctors they have seminars conferences they have lecture meetings uh, so on and so forth some are over uh, dinner lunch some food is being served some are pure and simple educational some are held in india some are held out of india for all these purposes expenditure and mind you in a in a substantial uh, form in a substantial manner the expenditure is incurred by the pharmaceutical companies and the dispute between the <coughs> companies and the income tax department was that can this expenditure be termed as an expenditure which is incurred in violation of any of the guidelines issued by erstwhile mci medical council of india or now we know it as national medical commission now the question is that those mci and nmcs are controlling the doctors they are admittedly not controlling the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies as clarified by my predecessor speaker but issue again is not whether who is controlling whom the issue here is i always thought that morality has got nothing to do with the income tax act you earn income you pay tax even if you earn income through immoral means you end up paying the taxes we have judgments right from prr singh to dr t a kureshi where in the view that is taken is that while implementing the taxes and laws morality has a very little role to play take a converse example if i am extremely moral do i get any tax exemption the answer is no i don't get any exemption and therefore the law is that morality has got nothing to do with allowability of an expenditure or taxing of a particular income now the question therefore is that supposing assuming that those pharmaceutical companies are acting in an immoral manner they are trying to bribe the doctors so the doctors go on prescribing the medicine which they are manufacturing and their sales would increase can it be termed as an immoral expenditure and can that expenditure be disallowed there were views and views recently honorable the mumbai tribunal uh, referred the matter to a larger bench and therefore they, in that judgment they have reproduced both sides of view both sides of arguments now the law is that that expenditure is directly covered by uh, small roman 2 of explanation 3 of 37 and therefore that is not going to be allowed as an allowable expenditure again a um, uh, uh, an, an action which is completely uh, i would say deviation from the accepted principles that even if the expenditure is immoral i am not saying illegal because ultimately the expenditure can never be termed as an illegal expenditure so long as the person who is incurring the expenditure is not violating any law uh, nonetheless uh, uh, that is what the law is now interesting would be that what happens to the pending litigation because now as i already pointed out that the language of the explanation says that it it shall be deemed to have always been like this and therefore the the pending litigation are also going to suffer and the last point which is covered under explanation 3 is that even if you have made any payment for compounding of an offense that amount is not liable to be allowed as an allowable expenditure both in india abroad so supposing you have a office an office is is having some illegal construction and if you pay the impact fee to the municipal corporation for the purpose of regularizing that then that is known as a compounding fee because you accept that you yes there is an illegal construction but you want to regularize that therefore you pay the price in us there is a popular concept known as plea bargaining there the litigation expenditure is so prohibitively expensive that people would not like to go into long run litigation they say that all right you are right let me pay the taxes and go home so those are also the compounding fees and and those are again running into a very huge sums so those sums again are also going to be covered here because they say that any fees that you you have offered as a compounding fee compounding presupposes acceptance of guilt the moment you say that this expenditure is a violation of a particular offense you are lose the uh, claim of that expenditure under section 37 a uh, very disturbing uh, uh, amendment and a large number of judgments are overruled uh, i am not giving you the citations of the judgments for the paucity of time let me take you to the another 
section where there is an amendment under section 14a 14a all of us are aware that 14a is for the purpose of disallowing expenditure which is incurred for the purpose of earning exempt income now exempt income all of us are aware that are generated in the course of carrying on various activities in some years exempt income is not generated in some years exempt income is generated in a huge quantity so there is no consistency that every year will end up generating some exempt income and therefore we raise this argument before various judicial forums that sir you want to disallow the expenditure which i incur for the purpose of earning exempt income good enough what about the years for which i have never incurred any uh, i have never earned any exempt income and courts have accepted that argument that yes in absence of there being any exempt income for a particular year you cannot then say that sir you earned zero and therefore we will disallow something plus zero which is incurred for the purpose of earning that exempt income now what is it that is incurred for the purpose of earning exempt income there is no exempt income therefore there is no question of incurring of any expenditure gujarat high court probably one of the lead judgments cortec uh, was uh, thereafter confirmed by various high courts including delhi punjab haryana and so on and so forth now the law is amended they say that you forget exempt income we do not want exempt income on a year to year basis even if you do not earn exempt income in a particular year then also we will disallow the corresponding expenditure which you should have incurred for the purpose of earning the exempt income so again this is one uh, amendment which has reversed large number of judgments not only reverse the judgment look it what what hurt says settling uh, the the it takes time to settle the position of law and once the position of law is settled unsettling the same creates lot of pain and lot of agonies on the part of the assessees and this is something where the law is completely unsettled there is also introduction of the word non obstante clause namely notwithstanding anything to the contrary contained in the entire act the beginning of section 14a is also changed and that also is going to affect us because in case any conflict is there between the interpretation of section 14a and any other provisions of the income tax act then probably section 14a will have a superseding power uh, that would take me to the next amendment section 68 amendment now 68 amendment is something which is uh, hitting below the belt because uh, that is one area where uh, the amendment itself is running contrary to the government views on on giving priority to various sectors in a moment i'll immediately point out that how and in what manner this is a completely senseless amendment section 68 was there right from the beginning of the inception of income tax act now we have one amendment which is brought into the statute book with effect from 1/4 2023 and that amendment is let me slightly go back historically section 68 talks about cash credit any credit which is coming into the books of an assessee is required to be explained if you do not explain the credit that credit by way of a deeming fiction becomes your income now there are various parameters laid down by various courts over a period of time mainly three criteria that you have to establish the genuineness credit worthiness and the capacity of the party to invest to give you the money no dispute on that score with effect from 1/4 2013 we have one proviso which was added to section 68 and that proviso said that in case of a corporate assessees namely companies in case if they receive any share capital from a resident uh, uh, share applicant then you have to explain the source of that share applicant before in your hand in the hands of the company that share application money is accepted so in case of a company receiving share application money the source of source as we popularly call it is required to be established now we have an amendment 
which which virtually becomes the first proviso because the existing proviso is now named as a second proviso because provided further is added along with that proviso and what is the first proviso first proviso says that in case if any person receives any money by way of loans advances or any other nomenclature that person has to explain in what way in in what manner he the person who has given in the money namely his creditor has acquired that money so i have to give the source of the source and that to mind you there are two conditions not only i have to explain the source of source but that source of source is required to be explained up to the satisfaction of the assessing officer so you may be satisfied that sir i the, the moment i file the return of income of that person the person who has given me the money i believe that my burden is discharged however the assessing officer is not going to be satisfied because ultimately it is going to be a subjective satisfaction of the assessing officer based on maybe objective criteria but those criteria again are sub, open to subjective satisfaction and therefore you have to satisfy the assessing officer now what is the problem and why do, why did i say when i began that this is something which is uh, going against the basic theme of this government look all the while this government in this budget and all earlier budgets have said that we are very much worried about msme sector we are very very much worried about micro and medium and small industries because they ultimately are the persons who keep the economy going uh we may be happy with few big time businessmen but however for the purpose of country to really prosper we need large number of medium small and micro ent uh, enterprises now these medium small and micro enterprises they usually do not have access to the banking facility to the organized sector organized finance sector it is very easy for companies like reliance and adani enterprises to raise the money because they can go into the international market and uh, you know they can float a few thousand crore worth of bonds and they can get the money generate the money at 3 4% interest at, at just a, a, a click of a mouse but for a for a small time businessman who is carrying on the trading uh, into some seasonal stuff and who has a turnover of less than 50 lakhs 1 crore rupee uh, even banks are not very willing to uh, finance them unless they give appropriate securities and guarantees so how do how how does this micro small and medium enterprises survive they survive by raising the money from an unorganized market and what is the mode of raising this money the mode of raising this money is loans and advances they borrow from friends they borrow from uh, relatives they borrow from local sharabs they borrow from local bro finance brokers and that is how they raise the money and that is how they run the businesses now with this one stock one amendment brought by this finance bill in my humble opinion is going to close down this activity because in each and every case mark my word in each and every case the assessing officer is going to add this amount as unexplained cash credit for want of subjective satisfaction he is not going to believe any proof that you produce before him because that has been the experience once you start Uh, giving the income tax detail they'll say that bring the bank account of that person once you bring the bank account of that person they'll say that immediately before your check was clear what are the credit entries you explain last 15 credit entries in that person's bank account now imagine a situation i am a small time time trader i i go to go before mrudang bhai ask for 5 lakhs of rupees as a loan and i ask mrudang bhai that mrudang bhai before you give me the money explain your source give me your bank account explain your 15 entries prior to this 5 lakhs of check and also tell me what you do for living now which person in the right senses is going to disclose all this information he is going to gurudang gurudang bhai is going to tell me that sir if you want money take it otherwise go home i don't want to give you the loan so this is the stark reality and this is what is going to happen and this is where it is going to hurt all of us maybe i know the intention behind this amendment is maybe noble intention that we want to curb the circulation of black money we want to control the accommodation entry providers we want to curb those transactions but that is not how the economy is done for the for those few defaulting and and i would say devilish tax payers you don't close down the system or you do not make the system completely unviable and unworkable 
so as to dry out the credit sources for the entire msme sector now if this credit dries out that sector is going to die because those people do not have huge capital they do not have access to stock market they do not have access to banks and finance and institutions for the purpose of raising legitimate capital so this one amendment is going to create large number of problems uh in 2013 the source of source was introduced into the statute book and therefore frankly that for eight long years we have never challenged the virus of that section uh, even the identical proviso which was applicable to the company and my personal experience is in in fact section 68 virus was challenged way back in 60s courts have turned down that virus and at this stage challenging the virus of this amendment this first proviso to 68 is going to be a herculean task because no court is going to uh, turn us down on the uh, allow our petition on the ground that this is this is something which is beyond the legislative competence this is very much within the legislative competence and we have already accepted the source of source principle way back from 14 2013 but nonetheless it is one area where probably one can explore the possibility of challenging this in a pil and and but more particularly by an organization which is representing large number of msme persons uh that would take me to the next uh, provision which is again uh, uh, section 144b 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 uh it's still in italics in 2021 act is still in a in a infant stage all of us are still trying to understand the faceless assessment scheme trying to familiarize ourselves with the ss assessment unit review, review unit technical unit and so on and so forth broadly what we have realized is this that faceless is creating large number of problems broadly on few counts mainly on four counts count number 1 you ask for time a very little time is given to you because they send the email usually late at night so around 11 11:30 one email would be uh, uh, sent to your inbox or something would be uh, uploaded into your portal uh next day when you open one day has already passed and within next to 48 hours you are required, required to place uh, on record large number of details in a digital format so one less amount of time more particularly when we are going through this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, because of availability of manpower etc again is a problem second is uh, where uh, uh, you know you're not given the copy of the draft assessment order or even if you are given the copy of the draft draft assessment order whatever that you file in response to the draft assessment order they are not taken into consideration third is that many a times you feel that sir my case is so complicated unless i come and explain you come and explain you doesn't mean physically come and explain you unless i come on the screen and explain you the nitty gritties of my case you would not be in a position to understand this none of those requests usually were granted by the national faceless assessment center and therefore all kinds of assessments some are good some were completely nonsense all kinds of assessments came to be finalized large number of petitions were filed before various high courts across the country on the ground that sir all these are broad in in broad category they fall under the breach of principles of natural justice and under the income tax act section 144b subsection 9 very categorically says that if any of the provisions of faceless assessment scheme namely 144b 1 to section 1 to uh, subsection 8 if any of the provisions are not followed in its true substance and spirit then the entire assessment order becomes known as assessment order and that assessment order would be no assessment order in the eye of law and therefore a uh, large number of petitions were filed across the country and courts were kind enough to realize that yes this is one area where we are finding large number of problem and secondly court also realized that this is new system and therefore it is still settling in people are still getting used to this new system and therefore we must give some relief to the assessees however now government suddenly realized that our faceless scheme is failing because of this handful of assessees who have challenged this uh, assessment orders directly before the high court and therefore they removed 144b subsection 
with retrospective effect, with effect from 1-4-2021. So all the pending cases where we have taken all kinds of breach of principles of natural justice as grounds are all going to be swiped off. All pending petitions in my submission, though High Court would be looking at it from a different angle because even gross breach of principles of natural justice, even in absence of 144B subsection 9, can still be said to be a gross breach of principles of natural justice and would still give um, jurisdiction to the High Court whereby they can allow the writ and cost and set aside the uh, assessment order. However, before appellate authorities, those who have preferred the appeals before the commissioners, alleging that, sir, this provision particularly is not followed or I was not given the copy of the draft assessment order before finalizing the assessment order. And therefore, my ground to this effect may kindly be allowed in view of 144B subsection 9 is now going to be dismissed because law is retrospectively amended. The faceless assessment scheme came into existence with effect from 14-2021. And with effect from 14-2021, this clause is now removed. There is one more, uh, I would say, a very startling proposition which is flowing from 144B. And that is, they have done away with serving a copy of the draft assessment order on normal SSCs. Now, what they say is that we will be serving the copy of draft assessment order only on the specified SSCs who are covered under 144C. So those who are uh, transfer pricing SSCs not on the normal SSCs. So we lose this opportunity of receiving the draft assessment order well in advance because that is now done away with, that is taken out from the scheme of 144B. No draft assessment is now going to be served. As against that draft assessment, we will be now served with an income or loss determination proposal. It is now known as income or loss determination proposal which would be served on us in the form of a SOCOS notice, that, mind you, is not going to be in the form of a draft assessment order because that is now done earlier. So again, this is one more setback uh, that we thought that the faceless scheme is very transparent and very open and gives us opportunity to deal with the case of the revenue at multiple stages. Now, one of the stages is taken away. No draft assessment order. And the last thing, a positive one. Mind you, I'm not criti criticizing the budget. I'm just putting the facts as it is. And therefore, whenever it, the credit is due to the government, I don't feel shy in giving credit to the government. Hitherto, under the faceless assessment scheme, the video conferencing request was a discretionary request because the language was that the authorities may accept and may grant you the VC facility. Now that language is changed, may is replaced with shall, and therefore there is a mandate of granting VC, namely video conferencing, on asking. So if you ask for video conferencing, the authorities are obliged, they are under a mandate to grant you that opportunity of personal hearing. So that's a welcome step. However, in overall basis, uh, they have taken out the air from faceless scheme. And now we have to rely on the appellate authority for redressal of our grievances rather than approaching the high courts. Next area is uh, virtual digital assets. Virtual digital assets, there was no specific provision for the purpose of taxing any of these digital assets. Now, those digital assets are defined under 2 into bracket 47. Uh, effect from 1-4-2022, that provision is going to be there. So now we have the definition. Definition is vast. It will cover all kinds of digital currencies, digital assets, uh, including bitcoins and all those kinds of coins which are generated in a particular manner and including NFTs. Second is that there was no mechanism to tax this. Now we have a mechanism whereby this uh, particular uh, transaction, the gain arising from this transaction is now going to be taxed. Now, what, what is that provision? Provision is 115 BBH. So we have now 115 BBH, which is now going to tax any gain, any profit 
arising on account of transfer mark the words transfer of a virtual digital asset this is going to be effective the provision is going to be brought into the statute book with effect from 1/4 2023 for assessment year beginning with 23 24 relevant to previous year 22 23 so up to 1st april 2023 we still are living in an era where there is no enabling provision which can tax a digital asset a virtual digital asset so if you are sitting on a huge bitcoin profit probably this is the time you should book it uh, i am not suggesting that you must book it i am saying that if there is a profit it is better to book that profit even loss also why do i say so supposing you purchase the bitcoin at a wrong time and today you are sitting on a huge loss you can still treat that as a loss arising out of your investment activity and you can still uh say that this loss is available to you as a capital loss if long term long term short term short term or you can say that i am in the business of dealing with bitcoins or cryptocurrency or uh, virtual digital asset and claim it as a business loss also in case if you do not and therefore that loss is available to you kindly mark after introduction of 115 bbh this loss will go you can't claim this loss as as a set off against any other income uh, in that year or against any other head or any other uh, carry forward or uh, you can't carry forward even that loss over a period of next few years gain if you do not want to enter into a larger litigation offer is offer this gain as a as a uh, capital gain and by pace today pay taxes at the rate of 20% and you can take advantage of this one month or two months time that you have uh, with you now government has come out with a very peculiar and a very unique scheme under bbh and what is that scheme scheme says that we'll charge you flat at the rate of 20% at the rate of 30% no this no no problems with that they said it will not allow you any deduction except for cost of acquisition so even incidental cost namely the the wallet charges or the membership charges or the transaction charges fees that you pay nothing is going to be allowed except for cost of acquisition one can say that cost of acquisition includes this cost take take your risk and argue but the plain reading reading is that all these incidental cost are also not going to be allowed number 1 number 2 this is a ring fence game this provision is a ring fence provision therefore it has got nothing to do with any other head of income or it has got nothing to do with gti namely gross total income so no set off of losses no allowances and no expenditure is going to be allowed against the taxing of this so gross basis you pay the tax at the rate of 30% whatever that that income is uh, the set immediate question would be that what if i have multiple transaction in bitcoin today i generated profit of 1 lakh rupee by selling some bitcoins tomorrow i purchase again i sold i made a loss of 50000 rupees can i claim a set off against these two because ultimately we are still in the era where the income is computed on a periodic basis and that period is one year so between in the in the period of this one month a one year can i say that there are some gains in bitcoins there are some losses in bitcoin ultimately the net result is either positive or negative do i pay taxes on the net result or on a transaction to transaction basis apparently it seems that one has to pay the taxes on a on a global basis namely on a yearly basis and not on a transaction to transaction basis uh because of the nature that kindly mark that your loss is not going to be carried forward now if your loss is not going to be carried forward people would be tempted to get rid of the bitcoins at the end of the year so your end volatility cannot be ruled out now kindly mark the opening words of 115 bbh the reason i am discussing this is because this scheme is going to create more problems than solving any 
one one five DBH talks about transfer. So income from transfer of virtual digital asset. Transfer is defined under two into bracket forty seven. Now transfer also means exchange because two forty seven talks about exchange, uh, sell, exchange, extinguishment of any right, etc. So if if even if there is a swapping of the digital currency supposing you have bitcoins you like some other uh, ether coins so you swap this so even that swapping also would expose you to 115 dbh because it is ultimately considered as a transfer kindly mark there is a difference there is a distinction between sell and transfer sell has to be picked up from that either from the transfer of property act if you are dealing into property or it has to be picked up from sale of goods act definition there are Whereas transfer has a definition under the Income Tax Act itself. Sale is exchange for a value. So unless you receive price, there is no sale. Whereas transfer means even exchange also is transfer. Even extinguishment is transfer. So therefore, transfer has a much wider meaning, and therefore it is again going to create problems, which is uh, probably only time can tell us. One more interesting. amendment which has also been introduced by the uh, parliament in this finance bill they have also amended the definition of property under 562 they say that the property includes all kinds of virtual digital assets therefore under section 56210 small roman 10 whenever a person re receives any property without consideration then the fair market value of that property would be treated as income from other sources in the hands of that recipient now supposing if i am gifting bitcoins to a friend of mine very close friend of mine how that transaction would be taxed gift again problem is transfer includes transfer by way of gift because under section 47 gift is specifically excluded gift is specifically excluded from the purview of transfer therefore the general meaning is transfer includes any exchange in a gift 47 says that gift will not be treated as a transfer for the purpose of levying capital gain tax only under section 45 therefore gift is a transfer therefore i have given the gift to a friend of mine therefore in my hands it's a transfer however i am not receiving any money against that because it's a gift therefore it is going to be treated as a loss in my hands i am not receiving a single rupee it is zero therefore transfer in my hands the entire cost of acquisition would become loss of that year in the hands of the recipient now recipient also receiving bitcoin by without paying anything so under section 56210 it will become income from other sources in the hands of the recipient now mind you there 115 dbh cannot be applied for the simple reason that there is no transfer in the hands of the recipient he is only receiving the bitcoins and therefore in his hands the market value of that bitcoin would become the income from other sources now income from other sources in the hands of my friend loss in my hands now supposing if my friend has some losses under income from other sources in that very year he can claim a set off whereas in my hands i have suffered a loss on account of transfer of a bitcoin if i have profits from other transaction of bitcoin i can always claim the set off so this 115 dbh again is going to be misused for the purpose of shifting of losses from one hand to another hand by giving the gifts of bitcoin in the hands of those persons who have some profit or some losses in income from other sources for that year carry forward losses set off etc is not available under income from other sources therefore that kind of planning is not going to be there but the gifting itself is going to create a problem because revenue authorities would try to tax it under bbh in the hands of the recipient which in my view is not going to be the correct view because under 56 it has to be treated as income from other sources now kindly have a look at the tds provision because simultaneously there is a introduction of tds provision also where government wants to get catch all those persons who are dealing into bitcoins because they want to they have introduced a provision of tds one person only 
the whole idea is that let the transaction be known to the parliament, known to the revenue authorities. This is more weird. 194S, in my humble opinion, is not workable at all. Because what, what does it say? That any person who is responsible for paying to a resident any sum by way of consideration on transfer of a virtual digital currency. Now, who is that person? Government, apparently those who drafted this provision never dealt into this Bitcoins. Because Bitcoins are not available in a lorry on streets. I don't get to meet the person who is selling me the Bitcoin. It's not unlike properties where buyer and seller get together physically or over, over Zoom, over a screen. Here, I do not even know the identity because Bitcoins are traded over exchange or some digital platform. Now, that platform, I do not know who is selling me those Bitcoins. How do I identify that who has, I'm paying to whom? Supposing today I purchase certain Bitcoins, I have to pay to the seller. 194S, capital S says that I have to deduct PDS at the rate of 1%. Now, how do I... Uh, no, who is the seller? I do not have the identity of the seller. Unless I have the identity of the seller in whose credit I deposit the TDS, I need to have PAN details of the seller. I need to have KYC details of that seller. Because ultimately, TDS is you are deducting tax on behalf of the recipient of that gross amount. It's a prepayment of taxes on behalf of the recipient. I do not know who the seller is today. How do I deduct TDS? Second stage, supposing it is the exchange, because apparently it looks that at some stage, government is conscious that it is going to be dealt on a floor of a store, uh, of a exchange or a platform, because they say that when there is a conflict between 194O, 194O, all of us are aware that it is a TDS obligation on the part of uh, e-commerce, um, uh, operators when they make payment to the e-commerce participants. So in case there is a conflict, then you forget 194O, you give preference to 194S. So they know that this is going to be implemented, the law is going to be implemented by the e-commerce site operators, namely the platform operators. Now platform operators, how, how would they pay the TDS and how would they uh, uh, give the certificates, etc.? to in favor of the persons who are selling. Uh, again, uh, it's going to be a Herculean task, large number of problems that who has to deduct in whose favor the same is required to be deducted and how the TDS certificate is going to be generated, how the transfer is going to take place. Now, on the top of all this, Parliament has also now proposed that the provisions of 203A, namely obtaining the TAN, and second is 206AB. 206AB is a higher TDS obligation on for non-filers. Now, Parliament says that that 206AB, that higher deduction of TDS, that is available only to that protection of not following 206AB is available only to the specified entities. Specified entities are individual and HUF having a business turnover less than the prescribed limit in immediately preceding previous year. Now, what if somebody is a company or what if there is, it's, it's a, a LLP or a partnership, they would never fall under the, the specified person. Therefore, every transaction, even transaction less than uh, 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 50,000 rupees uh, and uh, 10,000 rupees for other persons, they have to deduct the tax. Now, before deducting the tax, they have to inquire that, sir, on the floor of the stock market, whoever is selling, has he filed his return of income for earlier two years? Because today it is the provision is earlier two years. There is an amendment proposed in finance bill in this year where they are reducing that from two years to one year. But one has to find out that whether that person who is selling the bitcoins, has he filed any uh, return of income in the immediately preceding previous year? Then I did the tax at a particular rate. If he has not filed and if he falls under the non-filers list, I have to deduct tax at a higher rate. What if he does not have PAN number? Do I uh, then deduct the tax at a, at a substantially higher rate? So these are the problems which are going to make the whole system unworkable. This is a, one example where without giving any thoughts to the ground realities, provisions are introduced 
just for the sake of introducing them uh, without thinking about the plight of the persons who are genuinely dealing into this kind of uh, virtual digital currencies. That would take me to the next provision, uh, 94.8, uh, that is bonus stripping. I think my predecessor speaker has just uh, touched that. Let me indicate what is it that is going to create problem. Uh, 94.8 is ultimate, uh, originally that provision was very much available in the statute book. It was only applicable to uh, the uh, dividend stripping transactions, namely the, the transaction with a view to earn dividend and then claim losses because of reduction in the prices after the units or shares become X dividend. However, the, the share market was completely uh, unconnected with this. It was operating as if uh, there, is a, there is no such provision. And what people used to do was they used to buy the shares come bonus. After receiving the bonus, as per the rules under the Income Tax Act, the bonus shares would be valued at zero rupees because there is no cost of acquisition. However, the original shares will reduce its value by half. Let's say if the bonus is in the ratio, one is to one. So I 100 rupee acquisition cost, I'll sell it at 50 rupee because 50 rupee is now lying with me in the form of bonus having nil cost of acquisition. And therefore I claim the losses, immediately set it off. And as and when I sell the bonus shares, I would pay the taxes on entire consideration. So it's only shifting of the gain. It is only shifting of the tax burden from year one to year two, three, when I later on transfer the bonus shares. Now government has come out. In fact, it, the reason why it is uh, the government has come out with an amendment is the judgment of none other than Adar Punawala, the vaccine uh, magnet. His judgment in the case of ITAT Pune bench, this aspect was negated. Revenue's argument that 94.8 in its present form would also cover all kinds of units uh, issued by uh, REITs, that is uh, Real Estate Investment Trust or business investment trust, all kinds of uh, alternate investment fund trusts where they issue units in proportion of your contribution. Uh, that was negated by Pune Bench in order to overcome that. Now we have 94.8, which says that any such transaction would not be, you, you, you would not be in a position to claim any losses against any such uh, uh, bonus stripping exercise. Uh, this is effective from 1-4-2023. So you still have two months if at all you come across any bonus script, you can still try your luck and claim that. Uh, next is uh, 115 BAB and 80 IAC. Both these are welcome move. This is a positive development. 115 BAB is special tax treatment in the hands of a manufacturing company. Uh, it was to be start before 23, March 23. Now one year more, so March 24. So we have one more full year of additional benefit for a specified manufacturing company. ATIAC is for startups. There also, the date for uh, commencing the startup was uh, 2022, March 2022. Now it is extended by one year and you can still claim the uh, allowance under section ATIAC for one more additional year. Two more uh, amendments, which are both uh, retrospective, However, uh, they are not going to create much of a problem for the reason that uh, they are sequestered, they are consequential to the amendments carried out in Finance Bill 2021. Amendment number one is in Section 50. Uh, section 50, uh, last year, all of us are aware that uh, there was this amendment in Finance Bill 2021, which has now become Act, that you can't claim depreciation on goodwill. So those who have goodwill lying as a depreciable assets in the block of assets were required to transfer that goodwill from the block of assets to the capital assets. Because as and when you sell, you can claim as a capital gain. If at all, you earn money out of it. And therefore, the transfer from the block, existing block, was required to be carried out. However, uh, it was there was no clarity as regards what is going to be the treatment of such a transfer. Can it be considered as a sell or can it be considered as a transfer? Now the law is uh, retrospectively amended with effect from 1-4-2021 that such a transfer would be treated as a transfer. 
second amendment is 2 into bracket 42 capital c again there also last year there were uh, the slum cell was majorly amended what people used to do was that in the guise of slum cell they would argue that sir there is no transfer of the business undertaking because there is no transfer it is only sale of the undertaking therefore it is falling outside the purview of the capital gain mechanism and therefore no taxes now uh, last year in 2021 the law got amended they say that a transfer word was replaced and a sale word was removed for all practical purposes however there was one sale word which was appearing under 2 into bracket 42c which is now converted into transfer that would take me to the next major amendment 79 capital a a very interesting amendment and again will have far reaching consequences 79a is introduced into the statute book for the purpose of nullifying the claim of the assessees uh, whereby they would uh, claim set off of losses against the income which is disclosed in a survey proceedings uh, all of us are aware that whenever there is a survey department would insist for disclosure of undisclosed income be it a case of search survey requisition under 132b every time whenever there is a such an exercise or such an uh, visit by the revenue authority some on disclosed income would be honored later on when the ssc would file the return of income, they would claim a set off of this uh, income against various losses in the nature of past carry, carry forward losses or on its of depreciation now the law is that in case if you disclose any undisclosed income you can't claim any such set off and you have to pay the taxes on a gross amount and therefore the language is that there is no set off of any loss whether loss incurred in the year under consideration or any carry forward loss and second is on its of depreciation fair enough however what is not written and what is material for our purposes is there is no mention of any expenditure if i uh, just point out the exact language of the uh, section section 79 a does it says that undisclosed income of any loss whether brought forward or otherwise or on absorbed depreciation so loss on absorbed depreciation there is no mention of any expenditure so in case of a builder supposing there is a survey today the builder says that sir i received 100 crore on money and therefore i am offering that as my undisclosed income which is in the form of receipts i also have incurred expenditure worth rupees 90 crore and therefore my net income is only 10 crore you pick up my recorded results also my net profit ratio is only 10% therefore assuming that this is my undisclosed turnover then what you need to allow to me is a uh, corresponding expenditure against this undisclosed turnover the word expenditure is not appearing in 79 so the question would be can one still continue to argue that sir in case of a builder when undisclosed money is disclosed you prohibit set off of losses you prohibit set off of one x of depreciation depreciation i am not claiming any of them but what about the expenditure and kindly mark the distinction between loss and expenditure both are different we have the judgment of supreme court 300 and sorry 312 itr 254 in the judgment of woodward where in supreme court explained this distinction beautifully because it was a case of foreign exchange loss and the argument of the revenue is foreign exchange loss is nothing but expenditure and therefore supreme court distinguished between the two that loss is not equivalent to expenditure so then one can argue still argue continue to argue even after 79a that i am not claiming losses or depreciation at least allow me the expenditure and apparently it seems that expenditure is still allowable unless they uh, correct this in the act when they bring out the act there is one corresponding amendment small amendment under section 79 or uh, 79 you are aware that in case if there is any change in the shareholding in excess of 51% then the carry forward loss is not available for the purpose of set off because there is a change substantial change in the ownership government is now doing lot of uh, disinvestment exercise in large number of psus and most of them are loss making 
would be having huge losses. So government said that for the purpose of disinvestment, even if there is a change in the shareholding in excess of 51%, for the purpose of 79, you don't disallow the losses for the time being, unless of course, once the disinvestment process is over, and once we part with 51% and more shareholding in favor of the buyer, then you can reapply the provisions. So for interim period, you suspend application of 79, which has been accepted by the parliament. That would take me to the next amendment, uh, which is amendment under section 40, small a. Look, what is the controversy? 40a is basically a disallowance section. So the expenditure which you can claim under section 30 to 37 can be disallowed under section 40 if you do not fulfill the conditions. And one of the disallowance is that whatever tax that you have paid, you can't claim it as an allowable expenditure. So taxes are to be treated as a non-allowable expenditure. And the controversy is that what if I pay sales and surcharge? So sales, maybe whatever may be the nomenclature, is nothing but a payment which I make to the government. Surcharge is also uh, is that kind of a payment which I pay based on my income. Can, can I say that this, like any other payment of GST, etc., which is based on turnover, this is a payment which is based on my income tax. And therefore, this is nothing but additional levies, which does not have the characteristics of in, uh, tax. And therefore, you allow me. Uh, lead judgment, CESA, GOVA, etc., large number of tribunal judgment. In fact, recently, Calcutta Tribunal took a view against the SSE. They said that uh, sales and surcharge is nothing but taxes. They are different forms of taxes and therefore it has to be disallowed. What is surprising is government changed this law accepting the tribunal judgment and they changed this law with retrospective effect from 1-4-2005. So one fifth effect from 1-4-2005, now the law is amended and everywhere, wherever uh, this is a, either is a subject matter of controversy or pending before uh, any of the legal forums. All these uh, matters are going to be decided against the SSCs. In fact, those SSCs whose assessments are not there, their assessments, there is no formal assessment under 143.3. Also, their assessments can be reopened to give effect to this. If at all, they have claimed this as an allowable expenditure. Uh, Again, the trend of retrospective amendment continues. Uh, next is 43B. 43B, the amendment is, in fact, the, the whole idea of this amendment is to reverse the judgment of MM Equa Technologies of Supreme Court, uh, 129 taxman.com 145. The judgment is a recent judgment, 2019 judgment. In fact, one of the last judgment delivered by Justice Nariman, one of the finest uh, tax, or I would say, uh, one of the finest judges that we ever had in Supreme Court. Uh, this was one of the last judgment of Justice Nariman, where he held that 43B actual payment is required for the purpose of claiming any expenditure. More particularly, when the expenditure is in the nature of repaying outstanding loans, which are borrowed from banks or financial institutions. However, those outstanding loans were converted into debentures. And that is how the loan obligations were discharged. SSE in that case claimed that as an allowable expenditure because according to the SEC, this is nothing but discharge of my existing liability, maybe by issuing a different security, namely debentures. Justice Nariman accepted that sitting as a Supreme Court judge and Supreme Court said that yes, any existing outstanding loans and advances which are converted into a different security, namely debenture, can be held to be a proper discharge of the existing liability and therefore 43B claim can be allowed. In order to reverse that, now government has also added, parliament has added the word debenture in all these explanations. So th that is something which is again, fortunately it is prospective, 1-4-2023. But now even if you convert loans into debenture, you can't claim benefit of 43B. Uh, three quick assess, uh, the three quick amendments. One is introduction of 156A. 156 is a demand notice. 156A is a power given to the assessing officer who can now modify the demand notices even without there being any appellate order and or revisionary order. 
so without giving effect to uh, any of the income tax appellate uh, authorities order now 156a empowers the assessing officer to give effect to ibc's orders the orders passed under ibc by nclt nclat or supreme court and all of us all of you are aware that under ibc when the the company undergoes a resolution plan the tax liabilities are completely wiped off in many cases and because of that there is a necessity to reduce those liability or to recognize the order of nclt having impact on the outstanding tax dues there was no enabling provision now we have 156 which is an enabling provision with effect from 14 2022 there is one more amendment uh, under section 170 capital a 170 capital a is brought into the statute book again uh, to i would say a remedy a situation which was indicated in fact this time government has done a positive thing they have accepted the judgment of dalmia powers held by supreme court where in the view was the, of the supreme court was that there must be an enabling provision under the income tax act whereby the successor company namely after the corporate restructuring in case if there is an amalgamation the amalgamated company the resultant company must have some window whereby they can file the return of income for past transactions which have now been merged with them therefore now the law is under section 170 capital a immediately after the order of the adjudicating authority namely nclt uh, supreme court or any other adjudicating authority uh, one can file within a period of 6 months a return of income giving effect to the past transactions of other corporates which have now merged into the corporate entity the next is 170 section 1702a uh, next amendment is under 170 uh, subsection 2 capital a is now introduced 2a is uh, in fact again this is with a view to nullify the judgment of maruti suzuki which held that in case of an amalgamation unless the notice of 1432 namely pending assessment proceedings is issued in the name of amalgamated company the surviving company the entire assessment is null and void now it's a well reasoned order by justice chandrachur in order to overcome that now the parliament says that during the pendency of this re, uh, the realignment namely uh, the restructuring process where uh, company amalgamation is pending de merger is pending or a corporate restructuring exercise is pending during the pendency of the pendency of this proceedings if at all any proceedings are initiated against the one entity it will continue to be there it will continue against another entity which is a resultant entity so uh, in case if there is a there is a notice under 1432 in the name of amalgamating company a final assessment order can be done in the hands of amalgamated company without having to even issue notice to the new entity however what is left out is once that process is over this is only during the pendency of the process before nclt or any any such other forum however once that process is over once the company gets amalgamated into another company it ceases to exist then proceedings cannot be initiated in the name of a non existing company that law would continue to operate and that law will continue to govern the field therefore in case of a company which is already amalgamated into another company no reopening can be issued because that company is no more in existence that is something which is not disturbed by 172 into bracket 2 capital a the next is 158 ab Uh, a welcome move by the government in the direction of reduction of litigation the whole idea is that in case if if we have a large number of matters before jurisdictional high court and the supreme court we want to reduce that pendency and how does one do it so for the purpose of this we pick up the orders at the earlier stage for the purpose of supreme court we pick up the order of the high court for the purpose of tribunal appeals we pick up the order of the Uh, uh order of the cit appeals what we do is once we have this order we find out that whether the ssc has identical kind of case 
or any third party has any identical issue pending before any of the tribunals or the jurisdictional high court if we find that that is the case the collegium or consisting of two chief commissioner or principal commissioners would move a proposal that sir in this case don't file the appeal let us wait for the outcome of this appeal with a declaration to the respective appellate authority namely tribunal and or jurisdictional high court the declaration would be to the effect that sir we are awaiting and therefore allow us to remain dormant they would remain dormant till the judgment is delivered once the judgment is available either scenario either judgment is in favor uh, of the ssc nothing is to be done those matters would die there if incidentally the judgment is against the ss in favor of the revenue revenue would revive those appeals before either before the tribunal or before the high court within a period of 60 days and then they they argue the matter there are uh, two problems it's basically an old uh, wine in new bottle because we I, we have identical provisions 158 capital a which is operating for ssc and 158 double a also is there which is again very very sparsely uh, hardly used by the revenue authorities the second problem is that in case if it is ssc's own case there is no problem but in case if it is third party's case then the consent of the ssc is very material unless the ssc gives his consent that sir yes my case is identical to that third party's case no such 158 ab action can be taken so these two uh, anomalies probably uh, would uh, prevent the use of this section and, and how far actually this section would result into reduction of litigation is something only time can tell us uh, today it is very difficult to fathom uh, as regards uh, my previous uh, predecessor speaker pointed out that there is a possibility of a huge interest burden uh that possibility cannot be ruled out however under 220 subsection 6 one can make an application to the assessing officer for the waiver of the interest because pendency is uh, re revenue has opted for 158 uh, ab uh, penalty again uh, is not going to be a problem because uh, it's only if the cit appeal is against the ssc or the tribunal is uh, sorry cit appeal is against the revenue or the tribunal is against the revenue then only the question of not filing the appeal by the revenue will arise and in that scenario in any case penalty is not going to be levied however eventually if you lose then even the penalty also which is kept in abeyance dormancy would again get revived uh then next would be uh, two small uh, clarificatory amendments 2011a and 206c subsection 7 now the interest is made compulsory 206 ab and 206 cca the definition of non filers for both tds and tcs proceedings now the non filer would be a person who has not filed his return for immediately preceding one year rather than two years existing two years now is reduced to one year so less burden on the chartered accountants in finding out whether he has filed the return or uh, she has filed the return of income or no next is introduction of section 194r read with 284 uh 194r talks about deduction of tax at source in case if any person has is responsible to make payment to any business entity which in whose hands the the receipt would become income under section 28 small roman 4 28 small 4 talks about any benefit or any perquisite in any which ways for a value if it accrues in the course of carrying on of the business in the hands of a businessman it will be treated as a business income and 284 would get kicked in now there is a burden of a uh, deduction of tax at source under sec section 194 capital r the payer responsible for making this payment has to make the payment of tds at the rate of 10% uh threshold is again 20000 rupees there is an exemption given to uh, the specified person namely individual and uh, uh, hufs uh, however here there are two conditions one apart from the fact that one condition is that turnover of the individual and huf concern uh, should not should be less than uh, 50, uh, 1 lakh 100 uh, lakhs in the case of a business and should be less than 50 lakhs in case of a profession however that is in the immediately preceding previous year however in the year namely 
in the year under consideration there need not be any business income so even if there is 1000 rupee business income then you can't claim a status of a specified person and you have to apply 194 r now what is more problematic is that in case if this benefit or perquisite is in a consolidated manner wherein part is paid in cash part is paid by way of some paper some perquisite then how to give effect to the tds in order to understand this supposing i have to make payment of rupees 100 supposing there is a consolidated payment of rupees 100 out of 100 my obligation is to deduct tax at source of rupees 10 However, cash payment is only rupees 5. 95 is by way of some other perquisite. How do I give effect to 10% TDS? Then the law says that the person who is under obligation to pay the amount has to make sure that the recipient had made paid taxes on this receipt. Now, this is something which is going to again create problem and it is going to create, uh, uh, going to make the section unworkable. Then how do I make sure that the recipient has paid the taxes supposing i have to make the payment on first of april on any given year how do i make sure that the 95 rupee which he is going to receive as by way of a perquisite is going to be incorporated into his return of income which is going to be filed so that i can make a statement that sir he has paid the taxes because my obligation to deduct tax would arise in the immediately next month in the may Whereas his obligation to pay the taxes would arise in after the year is over when he files his return of income. Only then I know that whether he has paid taxes on these or no. And there is no system whereby I can make sure that he has paid the taxes in the month of April itself. So this is again going to create huge amount of problem. 194 IA 1% one TDS is now required to be done on stamp valuation and not on the actual consideration. If stamp valuation is higher. If actual consideration is higher, you would continue to deduct tax at source on a higher amount. That would bring me to the changes which are carried out in 148. Uh, 148, there are large number of changes. Most of them are superfluous, uh, nothing of substance. Only thing is, uh, what is material for our purposes is, Information is defined under section 148. In the existing scheme, information means two things. One is CBDT risk management strategy and any fallout of that. Second is any audit objects and finally accepted by the assessing officer. Now they have widened the scope of this information. CBDT risk management strategy remains as it is. However, the word flag is removed. So even if it is you are not flagged, uh, the department can still reopen. Thereafter, there are now three more categories which are added. Category number one, audit remains as it is. However, the word final audit objection is now no more there. So even if it is an audit objection, which is not accepted eventually by the authorities, that audit objection would still trigger reopening. So it's not final audit objection, even intermediary audit objections are now covered. So scope is widened. Any information received under section 90 or 90A from third countries with which uh, we have DTWA. So if, if some information is received from Dubai, that some income is required to be taxed in your country, then that would become an information. And then we have one more additional uh, uh, category of section 135 capital A. 135A is a faceless information collection mechanism where 133 B, C, 134, 135, all those sections are covered. And whatever information that is generated would be now treated as an information. Mind you, though, those information uh, would be wide in nature and it could be anything and everything. Every such material would form a basis as an information and your reopening can be done based on this information. And lastly, any information which requires action in consequence of the order of a tribunal or a court. Now, one can give the widest meaning to this, that any information which requires action in consequence of 
an order of a tribunal or a court. Unlike 150, 150 has large number of checks and balances. This is as wide as it comes. That anything which is worth consideration flowing from the order of the tribunal can be treated as an information for the purpose of triggering a reopening in the hands of uh, in the hands of a particular SS. Imagine a situation. A diary page is reproduced wherein Hawala operators has given Hawala to large number of entities that is reproduced by the tribunal. In that name and permanent account numbers are written. Your SSC figures in that list. Assessing officer of the concerned person in whose case tribunal has given a finding reads this. Oh, there is a name of someone and his permanent account number is there. He can inform the jurisdictional assessing officer that, sir, this requires consideration. And based on that, now the assessment can be reopened. So, therefore, uh, this is something which is very, very wide and create going to create large number of problems. Second amendment worth mentioning is, uh, is uh, under 148 capital A, there is a deeming provision which says that in case of search, there are categories and survey action. There is a deeming provision that for three years, we can reopen. Now that three years are removed. So there is a deeming provision that they can reopen. Number of years are not mentioned. So that is again going to create a problem because overall restrictions under 149 remains as it is 3 and 10. However, this three years deeming uh, uh, presumption that there is an escapement of income is now taken away. So that is uh, one area where it is going to create problems. Under 149, 1B, there are two time limits which are prescribed. One is three years, second is seven to 10 years. So 10 years. 10 years, again, the law says that only if we find asset worth more than 50 lakhs of rupees. Now that scope is widened. Along with the asset, they have also included expenditure, which you have incurred on account of any function, uh, marriages, events, occasion. So even that is now considered within the limit of 50 lakhs. And the third is any entry or entries in the books of accounts. In fact, in the while analyzing last budget, only I mentioned that this asset is now not going to cover those cash credit accommodation entries. So now they have brought in the amendment. They say that entry or entries in the books of accounts are also to be seen for the purpose of reopening between seven to or uh, between four to tenth year. So this again is going to widen the scope and we'll have a large number of reopenings. Uh, the first proviso, which was protecting the SSC on the ground that if the reopening has become time barred on the 1st of April 2021, those reopening cannot be done under the new scheme, even if longer period of limitation, maybe 10 years are given. Now there, as again, six years, they have also added limitation provided under 153A and 153C. A and C both have limitations of six plus four years, so 10 years. So we'll again have a larger limitation period under the newer scheme and having a um, free hand given to the assessing officer. Uh, friends, with this, let me hurriedly make reference to three or four amendments, not take more than two to three minutes because it's already uh, uh, 1959. I thought I will be getting two hours and therefore I uh, kept two hours in mind. My time was shortened. Uh, only two or three uh, uh, major amendments. Uh, 271 AA, B, C and D now can be uh, done by CIT appeals. So amendment is only AO could have levied this penalty. Now CIT appeals also can initiate and levy this penalty. 263 TP order can be revised under 263. 139 8A a uh, uh, lollipop is given for the purpose of filing this uh, updated return. However, updated return is going to create large number of problems. It is more for the benefit of revenue than for the benefit of the SSE. And uh, again, the taxes are burdens are going to be very, very high. Uh, there is a rate change, again, not worth discussing, uh, except for MAT in the hands of a cooperative society is capped at 15%. Uh, there is a COVID-related benefit. Uh, COVID-related benefit is in twofold. One is you fall ill, 
you incur huge medical expenses your employer reimburses that medical expenditure that will not be treated as a perquisite in your head 17.2 amendment second uh, uh, line of uh, uh, amendment is again concerning covid only that supposing if it is reimbursement is not by the employer it's by some third party unconnected party then also so long as it is a reimbursement of the actual medical expenditure it will not become income in the hands of the recipient under 56 there is an amendment to that effect third uh, covid related benefit is if someone has died because of covid complications then a death compensation up to a sum of rupees 10 lakhs in the hands of the survivors or surviving family members would not be taxed under section 56 there are some amounts of uh, benefit which is given to the uh, international finance fin finance service uh, centers namely gift city etc maybe those are very very transaction specific therefore not worth discussing with this friends uh, there is only one major amendment which is left out and that amendment is with respect to section 11 and 12 uh, 11 and 12 uh, there are large number of positive and negative amendments but due to paucity of time, probably we may not be in a position to cover them. Except for that, all other important and substantial amendments I have covered. Friends, thank you very much for the patient hearing. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on the finance bill. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Kusharvai. Please give a big round of applause. It's really deserving the speech. Before hearing Kusharvai, and Kusharvai has rightly said that while the finance honorable finance minister is delivering his speech, the budget was seems like very silent. But the way Kusharvai explained, close by close, one can definitely say the technical proposals under direct tax laws are very much fastening and tightening the belt of the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tushar Bhai. I request Shivam Bhavsar to offer a certificate of appreciation to Tushar Bhai. Sir, please kindly accept this. This is very nice. I was missing all this. Uh, mementos and memories. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now with this, I request Honorary Secretary of Income Tax Bar Association, C. Shridhar Shah, to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to propose a vote of thanks where we have two senior advocates as our speakers and uh, the subject is of budget. Uh, so I wish to th uh, thank uh, Senior Advocate Firoz Andar and uh, Senior Advocate Tushar Hamani sir for the detailed analysis of the budget. Uh, Tushar sir, we definitely understand that the time was short, otherwise you could have dissected it more. And uh, there was a lot of clarity all the members must have got from uh, this lecture. Also, a uh, few announcements I would like to make. Uh, the first is about uh, the tax conclave we are going, uh, which is going to be held on 4th and 5th March by IT Bar and AGFTC and third consecutive. Uh, sir is always with us uh, at the tax conclave and I hope uh, he will be there with us in this uh, tax conclave also. So everyone who has not registered your friends, who have not registered, please register for it. Uh, soon it will be full and we are going to conduct it within the COVID uh, limits. So not more than 200 members, uh, participants would be allowed. Apart from that, uh, I would like to thank every participant to join it. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. Like thank you very much. much. Thank you, Tushar. It was very, very well-deserved. Yes, sir.